Nicholas is an artist, a uh, geometer and researcher with the title of Professor of Emeritus at Wilco, which is a research um, into lost knowledge organisation. Um, so his talk today covers his uh, in <coughs> research into the Napa Thau, which is an amazing Neolithic settlement, which is on Papa... Westray, Papa, Papa Westray. Westray uh, one of the Orkney Islands. So it's, uh, uh, it's years of experience here, years of uh, study, and uh, so please welcome Nicholas, it's going to be fantastic. Can, is this working? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, what do I say? Well, this is the, it's the tip of the iceberg, what I'm going to talk about, because it's the culmination of about 25... I went there in 1994, so it's 24 years' work. And the book on the left here is available here. There's only a few left. Um, there's some stuff I'm going to talk about, quite a lot I'm going to talk about that's not in the book. But there's also stuff in the book I'm not going to talk about, if you see what I mean. And there's a lot of stuff I've found at the Nap of Hauer since the book's been published that's very crucial. That I, this is the first time I've spoken about it will be today. Um, so we'll get to that later. This is a tour I'm running this July. I run one last year. It's to Orkney. We go to Nap of Hauer. Anyway, I'm not going to go too much into that. Oh, that's interesting, the way it did that. Um, okay, this is the Nap of Hauer. This is... Um, an aerial photograph of it. I'll, I'll, the first half of this talk really is to introduce the place, talk about the particular relationship between these two structures. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start with a quote. I'm sorry about this. I'm not used to microphones. But, and if it does this every now and then, I hope people can still hear me. So I've got a quote here. Um, there's a few, there's only three or four quotes I've got here, but I'm going to read them out. I'm not really going to talk about who wrote the quotes. If you're interested, you can look them up if you like. Um, a true building, whether it is a temple, a palace, or a house, represents the universe or some world or microcosm seen in conformity with a particular traditional perspective. So that's, that's quite a loaded kind of statement there. Um, yeah, I could speak all day about this one sentence. Obviously, I'm not going to. But it's the crux of the whole talk is about what a true building is. Now, a multi-storey car park is not a true building. <laughs> a conglomeration of concrete is not a true building. This, I believe, Nap of Howard, to be a true building. <coughs> right, can we all see this map here? This is, I mean, we all know where Orkney is. For me, it's very bleached out, but um, now we, we all know or where Orkney is. There should be Scotland here, but it's not there. Papa Westray is an island up here, a long way from the main island. All the, all the sites that are very famous, Scarra Bray, Mace Howe, Ness of Brodgar, all these places, they're all in this kind of area on the main island, whereas Papa Westray is the, one of the most northerly remote islands. There's only 70 or 80 people live on it. It's about three, three miles long. Um, and this is on the west coast. So you can see it's, it, there's two structures. And what you're seeing now is essentially what was built. 5,000, well, it's 3,500 BC, just a little bit older than that, which makes it 5,500 years old. If you Google it, it comes up, or even Wikipedia it, it comes up, I think, as the fifth oldest building in the world. So, and it's a thousand years older than the supposed age of the Great Pyramid. And um, you would have thought it looked similar to Scarra Bray, but this is about 400 years older than Scarra Bray. And the reason why... And who's heard of this place? Can you put, and, so there's a few people that have heard of it. That's quite unusual. And who's been there? Has anyone been there? Right, OK, yes. <laughs> um, that's only the second talk where people have even heard of this place because it's so far off the beaten track that you have to make a real effort to get there. But I do encourage you to try and do it, because it's well worth it. So you can see um, these walls are about five and a half foot high, which is apparently, according to the archaeologists, the original height of them. Very few stones were found inside. So it was used for about 500 years, 
and then it was deserted. And so for 5,000 years, was buried under sand. This, would have, this is the sea now. This would have all been land at the time. The sea level has risen apparently seven meters. So this would have been land, and there would have been a bay here. Um, two buildings, they are joined together by a passageway, which is a crucial part of this story I'm telling you. Um, this larger building here has an entrance here. This is the entrance to the smaller building. They're facing the same direction. These are the two entrances. This is the entrance, the external entrance to the larger building and to the smaller building. And they're, they're almost on the same line. Not quite. So I hope this has come out for you. Yeah. This is the original archaeologist drawing done in 1983 of, of both structures at Napa Power. I've kind of made my own because there's some confusing areas here. This area here is very confusing because they, she's included the paving stones, which I've omitted from here. I've just got the walls, or actually the ground plan. Um, and you can see the larger building is made of two rooms. These are upright stone partitions, about this high. They would have originally been higher. This building has got three rooms, one, two, three, with the fireplace right in the middle. This is the linking passage. And these are the two entrance passages. I have to give you a very brief introduction to this because otherwise the rest of it won't make sense. <laughs> so I, I want you to become familiar with these buildings. And each building has an axis going up the centre. It enters centrally through the doorway and it passes straight up the centre, just touching that post hole. So that originally would have been a post holding up a roof. Um, and I believe there to be another axis here. This is a very interesting structure. Um, it touches this point here and passes centrally on the inner threshold point. These, these stones here are only about this high off the ground. They're about this long. So, the larger building. You can see the two rooms quite clearly. These are the upstrike stone partitions. There would have been a post hole here and a post hole here. Now the roof had collapsed, there was no sign of any roof. It's supposed that it was either whalebone or wood, but there was no stone found in here, so it wasn't <coughs> tiled, it was probably turfed. But what you're seeing now is essentially what was built five and a half thousand years ago. Sand is a great preserver. Compacted sand does not move, so it doesn't, it doesn't wear down any of the stones at all. It's as, as what you see now, the people who built this would recognize that as what they built. This is a quern, which is a grinding stone. That's in its original position. That's been there for five and a half thousand years. That was used to grind razor shells. They added it apparently to their food. It would have made their food very gritty, but it would have, it's very nutritious, razor shells ground down. So this is my first visit, looking a bit younger there. Um, this is looking through, I'll go back one. This doorway here is the entrance to the passageway. This connects the two structures. What's crucial about what I'm telling you today is the relationship between the two structures. It's, it's very profound, and it's not obvious at first appearance. Don't be fooled by the fact that it looks like a Flintstone house. This is not what's going on here. There's so many more subtle things that um, I'm going to talk about. So I'm, sta I'm sitting in one of the rooms of the smaller structure, and I'm taking the photo um, from the larger structure. This is about four foot high. Right, I've got an another photo here, which I took last summer. Um, I wanted to point out this stone here. This is the only stone in both structures that has embedded crystals as part of the stone. I don't know whether you can see them, but there's a nodule there, there's a bit there, and there's, there's a bit there. Um, later on, I'll talk about the relevance of this. It's, it, this is a new thing I found out just the last month or two. And it's really crucial to the geometry of the whole of the structures. So this is the smaller building. I've got a plan here because I haven't got the whole building here. 
um, you can see this room here, which would be this room, and then you've got the fireplace in the middle of the middle room, and you've got a, another room here. And this is the entrance to the passage from the smaller building. Now, you can look at Scara Bray. Scara Bray is later, and it's... I don't know whether you'd call it finer building technique. This looks a bit rougher, but we don't know if the walls actually look like this. They could have plastered them with some sort of something. They could have had something covering them. I doubt very much that, just like you, wouldn't like this as a wall. It's pretty cold. They wouldn't either. So this is probably not how it appeared then. Right, I'm going to talk about these axes, axis of each building now. This is um, looking into the larger building. These are the two partitions, and you can clearly see the two rooms. Um, this is a quote from Gwen on um, the Great Triad, the book. Um, Although the axis is not always given visible form in traditional buildings, it always plays a fundamental role in their construction, which is regulated entirely with reference to it. I believe these buildings are rela related entirely to their axes, and what that axis is, I will tell you about. Now, if you take a straight line, entering centrally here, straight up through the centre, this white stone is exactly symmetrical in the centre, perfectly placed, so you can see it from outside, even if these stones were higher. These are two stones, and they're, they're, I originally thought it was one stone that had split. It's two stones. Um, and that's exactly on the central axis line. That, that may not be relevant, but to me it is. Um, but it's a minor thing. This is the axis. That, this is on the tour that I went to last year, that I, I ran last year, last July. And we've actually got a tape measure measuring out the axis here. So you can see the size of it. You can see the size. Um, it's about five foot high, these walls. This is about four foot as well, I think. It's, it's, it's about this high. Right, that axis, I've got the axis here and I've extended it. And I've got a north, south, east, west. That axis is actually 27 degrees north of west. This is a very important angle. Because the, di the diagonal of a double square is 27 degrees. And if you take the side of a square, slightly mathematical, but I'll, I'll, you know, I'll put it in a way that I can understand it. Um, if the side of the square has the value of 1, then the, the length of that diagonal is the square root of 5. This will come up a bit later as well. Temple of Karnak also has 27 degree alignment. But in Egypt, that's the midsummer solstice sunset. Not, a, not an Orkney. It's much further north. The midsummer sunset would be up here. Yet this, this is a whole area of research that's yet to be done. Um, there's a tomb here, which is, we're told by the archaeologists that it was built by the same people who lived here. It's an exactly the same diagonal angle. So they're facing the same point on the horizon. So we're taking the axis of the smaller building here. Now, this is something that I've come up since the book's been published, and I thought it was quite interesting. You put a, a circle around the exterior length of the building, and I've taken this point here, level, not this point here, and you put an octagon inside of it, or two squares. This point here comes out quite clearly. This is one square here. So that kind of confirmed to me that this axis was an important point. This inner threshold point is very important. When you enter the passage, you're in a kind of a liminal area. Do you actually enter the building here, or do you actually enter the building here? It's really the internal threshold area is where you actually enter the body of the building. So this is a very important point. If you extend this line this way, it actually goes through the identical point in the other structure, 
which is not particularly that relevant. It's, it's, I originally thought, well, it's just a very minor coincidence, but it's the accumulation of these coincidences that built up and up and up over the period of maybe 15 years of this research. Um, that it, it's beyond doubt, this is all built in, intentional. Now here um, is, is a particular ratio called the golden mean ratio. Um, I have to explain, I'm sorry, but I have to explain what that is. And I'm sure a lot of you would know this, a lot of you may not. But it's, a, it's called the golden mean, this is the Greek symbol phi. Uh, it's called the golden section, the golden ratio, the divine proportion. Um, it's a particular proportion or ratio between two terms. And here I've marked them as A and B. So we're really we're looking at two extremes, that point and this point. And this point here has to be in a particular position. So that this is the value of 1 and this is the value of 1.618 dot dot dot. Now, what the dot, dot, dot means is this goes on forever. And that's what I mean by divine proportion. That's what's meant by divine proportion. Mathematics can't define it. Just, it's undefinable. So it's, it's also called the transcendent ratio. But you can draw it perfectly. How does this happen? Mathematics cannot define it, but there it is in front of you. It's a visual thing. I'm a visual person. I'm not a mathematician. Mathematician, and it took me a long time to understand this relationship between these two lengths. When someone showed me a way of reproducing it visually without any numbers, just by drawing squares and lines, then I understood it instantly. So, but but that would still take me too long to explain that. So, what the relationship is is, and I've written it down here, um, is the relationship between A and B. Okay, so the length of A relative to the length of B is the same as B to A plus B. Now, don't worry, it took me a long time. If you get it, it'll click, and then you can find out more about it. I'm not going to push it. Just think of it as a very important point there between two extremes. But it has this particular ratio. This particular ratio is also in a pentagon. And you can see these various lengths here. And you've got three lengths here instead of two. So this can go indefinitely smaller, and this can be indefinitely larger, according to that ratio. And I'll, I will bring in these three elements here in my talk. Um, so where is this at Nap of Hour? To me, it's pretty obvious, and it's a crucial part of this talk but it's the point that the buildings touch. They don't actually, they're not joined, the buildings. They're not combined like that. I mean, architecturally, the term is they abut one another. So they just touch. And it's, this is the golden mean point between the two extremes of the axes. Again, a little minor coincidence. I thought, yeah, fine. It was probably a year or two later. I looked more into it. And I thought, well, what can I do? Is the whole building governed by these ratios? So I thought I'd take, I can't remember which I've got now, because I normally have my computer where I see the next slide. But I, I'll go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, how would these people have done this? Would they have thought about it as 1 to 1.618? There's a very simple way of doing it, with a length of rope with 12 knots. So you're making this, this is a Pythagorean triangle. It's a three, four, five triangle. I'm not going to go into the geometry because it would hold me up. Um, but there's a particular geometric procedure where you find this point here. And that's exactly what... I'm going back a couple. That's exactly what this is here. And assuming this is correct, and I'm not completely into some fantasy here, this is the way that Neolithic people would have found any measurement. They, they would have had rope. We know they had rope, um, because there were cod bones found in this building, and they were large cod bones. Things about fish, you can't trade with fish, because if you caught a fish today, this time tomorrow, you can't eat it. It's inedible. There's no fridges. 
you know. <laughs> so all fish would have had to have been caught locally. And these were large cod. These were two meter long cod, which you only catch in water at least 20 to 30 meters deep. And the only way of catching cod like that is with hook and line on seafaring boats. This is something that these, these people are not really considered to be able to do, but they did it. They had fishing rods with hooks. No hooks had been found, but they had string or cord at least 30 meters long to catch these fish. And we know that because they found the bones. So they would have easily been able to do this, absolutely easily. So what I thought I'd do is I'd take this measurement here, which is the measurement from the, the large building's central axis to the point it touches the smaller building. And I'd make that the diameter of a little blue circle. And I'd, I'd start at the bottom, and I'd see where they fitted in. And it fitted in precisely five times in the length of the whole building. And in the smaller building, it fitted in three times, but slightly differently. Because in the larger building, you've got the exterior, and on the smaller building, you've got the interior rooms. Precisely, this is, made, this is accurate to the width of a finger or two. And this is about 42 feet long, this larger building. So I thought, well, that's interesting, another little cumulative coincidence. Um, so then I thought I'd look at this length here, which is the length between the smaller building's central axis and the point it touches the larger building. And again, it fitted in precisely. It fitted in exactly six times on the exterior of the smaller. But it also fitted in exactly on the interior of the larger. Now these lengths, this is something I'm going to bring in later on in a few minutes. Um, these lengths of the six red circles are identical. And there's something I'm going to talk about. Some of you might have spotted it already. I'm not going to talk about it now. It's a particular relationship between these two structures. Right, so this is um, sort of a picture I've done just to show the measurements. Um, now, I don't believe they would have necessarily thought in this way, these people who built this. this but they could have. There's something right at the end I'll show you which to me, shows that they perhaps did think in this way, using a pair of compasses. Um, but they might not have. It might have been a mixture of something more intuitive that comes naturally. But they would have, they would have exhibited this somehow in their art or whatever. But certainly these two buildings have these proportions in them, which is governed by the point the buildings touch and the central axes. And look at this V area here. Why is that? If you're going to build two buildings, there's so much wasted space here. There really is. I mean, what's, what's this gap here? What's going on here? Why didn't they make that one wall? And we know that this building was built, maybe the same people would have built this. It was just built 20, 30 years later. But you would have incorporated this and made, a, you know, you wouldn't have spent, wasted the effort building another wall. The wall's already there. So that's there for a reason. Now we'll explain what that is <laughs> a little later. This is still the introduction. I'm really sorry. I have to go into this. Um, okay, if we take the larger building, and these are measurements, some, most of these are measurements I've just shown you. So you've got the measurement of the little blue circle, which actually measures the length of this room here. Uh, the green circle is the same and gives you the lovely curve there, which fits the building. Not quite um, corresponding there. Um, the radius of the red circle being one. These are all me measurements I've just been talking about. The radius of the red circle um, measures it precisely the width of this building. And the radius of the pur purple circle. Now, the, the width of the red circle is the width of the building. The diameter of the purple circle is the length of the building. And the purple and the red circle relate to each other with the golden mean. So the width and length of this building is a golden mean rectangle. And it fits precisely inside a golden mean rectangle. Apart from this little bit here, which um, there's a drawing in the book um, where I've got some geometry centered on the small building here, 
which actually kind of does explain that, but it's something that would take me too far off my route. Um, Okay, you've seen this before, but I wanted to point out this compartment here. Uh, it's about this big. Now, what on earth it was used for, I mean, it's, it's, we, we have no idea. Obviously, it's a compartment to put objects, storage or something. Um, it also is a golden mean rectangle. The, the proportions of it, the height is 1 and the length is 1.618. This just confirms that these proportions are part of this building. Right, this is one I was going to skip over because it's got some numbers and normally people seize up with numbers. But I, I, will, I will go through this quite briefly. This is about Alexander Tom's work in his book, Megalithic Sites in Britain. He, he, I'm sure a lot of you know this. Um, he, devised, he, he had an idea that there was a common unit of measurement throughout the Neolithic world in Britain, and for wider, wider than Britain. Um, and he called it the Megalithic Yard. And I, he'd spent like 20 years researching this, and he visited just about every stone circle, mainly stone circle, I think. Not dwellings, and not stone rows, but stone circles. And he arrived at the Megalithic Yard of 2.72 feet. Now, two yards is a fathom. Two modern yards is a fathom and two megalithic yards is, is called a megalithic fathom. But I've got the relevant ones here marked in yellow, uh, green, sorry. So the AB point between the two structures axes is 21.65 feet. Now if you divide that by 2.72, it comes out at 7.959. So just about so close to eight to be insignificant. Um, the external length of the smaller building <laughs> And the internal length of the larger building is 32.5 feet. And if you divide that by 2.72, you've got 11.948 and basically 12. Um, even the proportions of this triangle come out very interesting. Um, this BC length here is 16.3 feet, which comes out at 5.992. All these measurements um, correspond to Alexander Tom's megalithic yard. So it confirms Alexander Tom's work, but it's very interesting also that um, the internal, the, say the external length of this building is the same as this internal length here, which is half the length of this triangle. So the triangle's proportions actually relate to this building. Anyway, I, I don't think about this. It's too many numbers to think about. So, uh, Eliard, Sacred and the Profane. Um, I hope you've all read that book. Um, he's talking about traditional man and his dwellings. Um, his dwelling is a microcosm, and so too is his body. The homology house-body cosmos presents itself clearly. The temple and the house are regarded as a human body. That's very interesting statements there. Uh, can we see Napa Power as a representation of a human body? Well, the small building definitely, I think, is, is, a, is a reproduction of a human body. You have an abdomen here. That's very abdomen-like. Not everyone's, but definitely a bit mine. Chest, thorax area with the heart slightly to one side. It's like someone laying face down on the ground because the heart is slightly to the to the left, so you're not facing the person, you're like looking at their back. And you have a head as well. These are the three rooms of the building. Also, interestingly, these two stones here, if you actually look at my back, and you, you're roughly in the right position, these are exactly where the kidneys are, in exactly that position. They're not symmetrical, the kidneys, they're slightly skew-off like this. Now, I've shown you this before, um, that these lengths of the red circles are exactly the same lengths. This means the smaller building fits precisely inside the larger building. Absolutely precisely. Fingers width difference. Um, 
So what's going on here? Was this built intentionally? I believe this is intentional as part of the building. This is what's going on here. This is the relationship between the two structures. You can see that this building here has a larger head. Now, what kind of human being has a larger head? A young child or a baby, proportionally to the rest of the body. Um, look at the way they're... It's like two, a mother and her child standing next to each other. It's quite a sensitive way of depicting this. Now, you may think, well, where's the mother's head? This is obviously the abdomen, what I call the umbilical passage between both abdomens of both structures. Um, I'll talk more about this and where it corresponds to certain points in what I'm now going to call the child and the mother. Um, quite often in the um, Mediterranean, the, not the Willendorf Venus, I'm sure we know that, which is... Mesolithic is very old, it's like 35,000 years old. They don't have normal heads, they don't have heads with features. They, they have either golf ball type things or no head at all, quite often. Quite often they have an indentation in the middle of the shoulders where it's thought that heads were replaceable. For depending on the purpose, these things may have been used for rituals, depending on the ritual, different heads would have been used. But essentially the mother's, the head of a mother in this context, is not necessary. Right, slight detour, but it's not really. These are also other depictions of mother and child. Uh, we've got Iris and Horus, third century Egyptian. And we've got a painting by Bellini, <coughs> Renaissance Venetian painter. Um, there's a lot of correlations here. Well, there are correlations between the story of Isis and Horus and the, the Christian story of Madonna and Child. They are basically the same story. Uh, it makes the Christian story significantly pre-Christian. It's, it's not a Christian story at all. The Christians took it over, as they usually do. Um, all religions meld into other things. Um, even the depiction, look, a child on the mother. Um, he was born... Uh, Horus here was born of virgin birth, grew up to be a king. It's all very, very similar to the Christian story. But I'm going to talk about this for a little while because it does exhibit a continuity of ideas from the Neolithic through the Egyptian to the Renaissance. Um, I believe that these are all representations. These are obviously what they're... We can see what they're representing. This is a little bit more difficult to understand but I believe this is a, a similar representation of what we're seeing here, just for a different people for a different time. You look at the child here. Um, now, his third eye point is exactly a golden mean between the extreme sides of the picture. I'll put a line in there. So that yellow line is the golden mean between here and here. And look at, look, look at what their mother's doing. This tree also is a golden mean, by the way, on, in here. And there's all sorts of things going on here. Um, look what the mother's doing. Um, is the baby sitting on her knee? I don't think it is. It's more floating. Um, she's certainly not holding the baby up. Look at this hand here. It's, it's way too large. It's like a big builder's hand has come round. It's not the same hand. It's not the hand of the mother. It is, but it isn't. And look at this hand here. The elbow point is here. Or even here. Look at this arm here. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. It's kind of like this. But the reason why that is, is because of these fingers here. With her forefinger, this is her left hand, she's highlighting this axis of the child. And with this, she's indicating the heart point. And with this, she's covering the navel. And these are all important points in what we now call the subtle body. Um, clearly, they, in the Renaissance, people were aware of this. And I think these points are evident at Nap of Hauer as well. And look at this finger here. The finger that touches the axis is the ring finger. 
This is traditionally the finger that there was a vein from, from that finger to the heart. That's why wedding rings are on that finger. Um, look at the axis coming up straight out the top of the mother's head through the parting. There's an association here which is very, very close to, to the Napa power in the proportions and the depiction. And it's even closer because what she's highlighting here and what's being highlighted by this line here are the chakras. Now, we all know what chakras are. Um, this is a particular very early system of seven chakras where the crown chakra is white. Uh, in this system, there is no solar plexus chakra. Um, in, the, in the early documents, and I got this information from this book here, in the Vedic literature, there's no mention of a solar plexus chakra. It's a modern, made-up thing. Uh, and there are reasons for that. But originally, there was no solar plexus chakra, and that system fits this building precisely. You have your two base chakras here. Navel chakra, heart chakra on the half, throat chakra right where it should be, in the, in the human being and in the building, third eye and then the top of the head. But look where the navel chakra is. It's level with the umbilical passage. So it's, it's definitely the connection between the mother and her child is this umbilical passage corresponding right dead in the center of the abdomen of the child to the navel chakra. This, this, to me, when I found this out, it started to all come together and made sense, slightly. And this is a slightly, uh, this is mine, my version of this uh, traditional picture, which is kind of, you know, three or four hundred years old. Now, this is a drawing I did when I first arrived there 24 years ago. I sat in the fireplace of the child building and just sat there. I may have fallen asleep for a few minutes, but I woke up and I was sitting in this um, cross-legged position and I had a, an image of me sitting in, this is where I was sitting, basically, in the fireplace. I had a, an image of me sitting in the center of a spiral that was spiraling out towards the extremes of the, you know, spiraling out to the outer dimensions of the building. And here I had the inner rooms. So this is the inner room. So the outer wall would be up here. But later, I kind of slightly altered it to include the whole building. It makes a bit more sense that way. But I think I may have picked up something from this building, something subtle that kind of helped me along this, this idea. Right. Now, I'm going to go into a little bit of geometry here. It's about the relationship between the mother and the child and about the process of birth. This is a quote I found um, by Jessica Smythe, Settlement in the Early Irish Neolithic. So she's talking about dwelling, she's talking about Neolithic people, and she's saying that the construction of a house is often made analogous to the birth of a child, with the house spirit or soul installed in the house with a series of birth rituals. I think that there's a geometric process or procedure, it's very quite straightforward really, I will go through it, that, it, that describes the birth of the child from the mother and explains why the child building is positioned exactly where it is and why those gaps are there. So we've got the, the mother here with the circle encompassing her inner space. You can think of that as the womb of the mother. And that's what we've got here. Now superimposed on top of that, so now there are two circles here, is the child. Now I, instead of aligning it with the axis here, I've aligned it 90 degrees to the axis. So I've got, you've got two circles here. This point here is very important. It's the corner, the point of an equilateral triangle. So you can fit four of these equilateral triangles in this um, circle. So which makes this distance one twelfth of the whole circumference. I, I will talk more about this point because it's more important to do with the golden mean, but this point also is important here. 
So what we're going to do, we've got two circles. We've got the circle, the mother's circle will stay motionless, and we're going to rotate the upper child circle anti-clockwise around this red point. So we, we rotate it 60 degrees, and we rotate it another 30 degrees. This is the final built position. This is the position of the axis of the child building, where it was built. Does 90 degrees relate to nine months? Because this is a ritualized, geometric way of, of understanding the birthing process, perhaps. There may have been rituals when these buildings were built, or even this may be the purpose of this bu these buildings. They could be for mothers. There's no way of knowing. Um, so this is the two circles superimposed over the top. Uh, there's some wacky stuff going on. The point now this is this is not a proper vesica. The the circumference does not go to the centre of this circle. It's it's almost like a random two circles. It looks like random two circles put on. But look at this point where they cross. It's exactly corresponding to the golden mean point. This is very important. Oh, got a video here, it's playing automatically. I'm going to go through that again. So what, what we've got is this circle here has rotated from this circle around this point. So it's giving you the exact position of where this building should be built, which results in these gaps, it results in this. Um, according to the, the bodily, what they're trying to do with this building is reproduce the, the symbolic image of a child. I'll go back to that. No, it's going to happen straight away. It could also represent the turning of the child before birth in the womb. But I think the 90 degrees, this is exactly 90 degrees, um, is does perhaps relate to nine months. And again, I'm showing you this again. Um, this point here that's been rotated about, um, this is also a golden mean point. It's like a reverse, it's like a mirror image of this point around the center line. So this point of rotation is also a golden mean point between the two axes. And also, if we extend, I mean, in my drawing, you should have a line that you can see up here. It's just coming along, just the entrance to the passageway. And I showed you this earlier. This is the actual passageway. So this line here, going straight through that rotation point, is actually this plane here. So if you take that as a plane, on that plane is this stone here with these crystals. These are quartz crystals. It's, it's a form of sandstone, this. It's the local stone. This is the only occasion in these two buildings where there are crystals embedded in the stone. And they happen to be at the golden mean point between the two axes of the buildings. It, it's, and I, I looked up, I've been looking into quartz. This is a, what is called a milky quartz. It's not clear quartz, it's actually, um, and there's some over here on this door here, um, it's like this. It's quite translucent. It's not absolutely clear. I'm sure we're all familiar with this, this is quite common. Um, it's a milky quartz. Um, quartz is always used, I'll read this quote. Quartz stones and crystals are connected with spiritual beliefs and practices in a number of cultures around the world. They are often used by shamans or other religious practitioners who specialize in the ability to use altered states of consciousness for the purpose of healing, transformation, or the acquisition of hidden or sacred knowledge. For these shamans, the crystals symbolize sacred space, the place where all essential transformations are believed to occur. So, what I've, I've, I've included this quote because if a birth isn't a transformation, what is it? This, this, these crystals are there for a reason. 
and it's to do with the passage from the mother to the child. Perhaps a birthing process, perhaps mothers came here and they went through a process and the children were born and this other, but there's no way of knowing. But I, I, I believe they're to be instilled in the architecture of this building with these crystals. And th this happens nowhere else in this structure. This is the only occasion these crystals appear in the whole of these two structures. This has something to do with the transformation of birth from the mother to the child. This is a new thing. This is something I've only been aware of the last few weeks. And there's a lot more research to go into this. Right, well, that's 50 minutes. We're coming to the end now, so we'll have time for questions. This is a stone. You know when I showed you the Pythagorean triangle and I said, well, they, they may not have used thought of geometry in this way, using compasses. Um, but perhaps they did. Because this stone, I call it the Brodgar tablet. It was discovered at the Ness of Brodgar, which I'm sure we're all aware of what that is, on the mainland Orkney. Uh, which is about 25, 30 miles in a straight line from Papa Westre. So, and it's a Neolithic in size decorated stone. This is what the archaeologists say. Um, it's a portion of a stone. I think this stone is about this big. And you can see there's another piece broken off here. And I've actually found another photo with another piece here. But there's nothing, there's not many markings on it apart from a few. But... It, these lines are very, very interesting. There are a lot of parallel lines here. You've got two parallel lines here. You've got to, and they're curved, but they're still parallel. You've got these lines coming here, and they, they bend at the same point. <laughs> um, but we're going to look, look closer up at this area here. These are the... Now, to... to in size, an accurate line on a piece of stone, just using another piece of stone, is not an easy thing to do. These are not haphazard markings by primitive people who have no idea what they're doing. These marks have been put here intentionally and accurately and very, very carefully. There's no mistakes here. They haven't slipped. They haven't done anything like that. These are intentionally carved there for a specific purpose. And look at these lines here. These are lighter than these heavier lines. There's three of them. And there's also these lines here, lighter as well. Now, I don't know whether you can see, but there's a series of dotted lines coming up here, which I think have been indented into the stone. And there's an, it's a very, not a very good photo um, and also, it's a bit too bleached out. It needs to have less brightness here. But there's another line making a rectangle inside this, what looks like a triangle here. Um, and there's a kind of a rectangle here as well. So on this stone, you can actually practice geometry. You can actually have a pair of compasses um, and they would have been able to make compasses. You can make a pair of compasses out of a bent twig and a bit of string and a point. That's all you need. You don't need metal. Once someone objected to me saying this, saying, well, how could you make a pair of compasses that are without any metal? Because these people had no metal. It was a good thousand years before metal came. Well, of course you can. You can make you know, it's a bent twig with a bit of string. Um, a lot of indentations and things, which probably are weathering. But some of these holes are in really interesting points. Um, there's holes at the intersections of some of these, point, these lines. So there's a hole here. There's a hole here. There's a hole here. And there's these series of lines and holes coming up here. And this is exactly parallel. There's sort of a line going across there. So that's an important point. So, um, I mean, I'm not going to go into great depth here, but this is, it's, it's possible that... Um, you could have had this on a tabletop. You could have had six or eight people standing around. And you could have had a geometric master or someone versed in symbolism and geometry. Um, because the, what you're seeing, is it, it's not about just geometry. It went beyond that. It was about the symbolism of it. And you could have had several people standing around a master being demonstrated geometry quite easily here. It's a perfect size for that. Now, we've seen this before. 
Ah, I'll talk about this first. This is uh, sheep bones. It's an unusual collection of sheep bones that's uh, very unusual. And they're not unusual in Neolithic sites, but all of these were found in, I think, the smaller building. I'm not sure. It may have been the larger building, but they were found at Napa Power. Now, they used this as a couple here. You could imagine they range between about an inch. This is about an inch long, and this is about sort of three inches long. So anything between there and there. Um, some of these could have been useful. This one, this one perhaps, as actual pins, mending things, making things. But these, they're basically useless. They've all been sharpened to a point using the knuckle of a sheep bone. Useless to go through something. You, you destroy the material you're, you're trying to sew together. These could have easily been attached to a twig and used as a point on a compass. And some of these points could have easily been worn and over and down over the years. Now, this was found embedded in a wall at Nessa Brodgar. It's, we're told by the archaeologists that these lines were inscribed much earlier than the building was built. So this could have been a prized object that was embedded into the wall once this knowledge had been forgotten. Or maybe it wasn't forgotten. Maybe there was something still there that they wanted to instill into the new building. Now, we've seen this before. We've seen it in the Pythagorean triangle in relative to the Nap of Hauer. So this is a Pythagorean triangle, precisely. I know this isn't a proper triangle. It's actually made of two lines. But if you take that point, that point, and that point, that is a precise three, four, five triangle. Um, and if you swing the arc down, which makes the golden mean point here, it goes through this point. Now that creates that rectangle, which is a golden mean rectangle. So this could all relate quite profoundly to the Napa Hauer, and this was found 20, 30 miles away, um, and is dated to be around the, the time that the Napa Hauer was built. So it's possible that they, they could have used geometry to work this out. It doesn't matter if they don't, because the whole mother and child thing is crucial about this. Um, and that's it, really. That's a very brief version of what I'm talking about. I'm just showing you this again, my book, which is available here. And this is my tour, if you want to pick up a flyer, if you're interested at all. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.